Methaquilone is a sedative that falls outside the benzodiazepine and barbiturate classes. It was once a popular pharmaceutical and a widely used recreational drug. Due to a crackdown in the 1970s and 80s, it largely disappeared from the market. You can still find recreational use in some areas, most notably in Africa. Because it was minimally controlled initially, it was easy to access and became a popular alternative to barbiturates. A lot of lore exists around the effects. In reality, methaquilone is isn't a massively unique drug, but it can be more recreational than benzodiazepines. Among the positive effects are sedation, anxiolysis, euphoria, pleasant tingling sensations, pro-sexual effects, and disinhibition. The negatives can include headache, dizziness, restlessness, dry mouth, slurred speech, motor control impairment, nausea, vomiting, sweating, reduced heart rate and blood pressure, and unconsciousness. If the depiction of methaquilone in The Wolf of Wall Street is what comes to mind, you may have some misconceptions about the drug. While it is a recreational depressant, it's not in an entirely different league than barbiturates, ethanol, carisoprodol, and mepropamate. The core effects involve a mixture of sedation and euphoria. You can achieve notable levels of euphoria with a lower level of sedation than would typically exist with barbiturates. Some people need to fight off an urge to sleep, but others easily remain awake at common doses. The strong sedation it provides also doesn't last especially long, so it's easier to integrate into someone's day without falling asleep. It's fairly common to report a form of mental energy or stimulation at common doses, while the body remains relaxed and sedated. Methaquilone can reduce your inhibitions, raising the likelihood of inappropriate and unsafe behavior. Some of the effects are akin to ethanol, in the sense of staggering due to impaired motor control and experiencing an improved disinhibited mood. Your body can feel loose and relaxed, and it's common to experience paresthesia in the form of tingling. Warmth is sometimes present. It can become more difficult to talk, a especially with strong doses due to slurring. In the places where it's still used, such as South Africa, inhalation is common. This may produce a greater rush of sedation, relaxation, and euphoria, but it can also rapidly impair motor function, which can be dangerous. While there are perceptible differences, methaquilone can be compared to ethanol, barbiturates, carisoprodol, and mepropamate. It's more euphoric and recreational than benzodiazepines. Throughout its history, it's been combined with ethanol and other depressants in order to boost the effects, but this isn't a good idea. There are some popular myths about methaquilone that have existed since the 1960s, and some have been supported by portrayals in the media and in content like The Wolf of Wall Street. One of the longest running beliefs is that it's a strong aphrodisiac. In the 1960s and 70s, it was referred to as a love drug and also called heroin for lovers, with users saying it could greatly increase sexual desire. Those aren't titles that were really given to secobarbital or diazepam, but it's not clear that it's a direct aphrodisiac to to the extent people claimed. A lot of the pro-sexual effects could be coming from disinhibition, and the presentation of disinhibition as aphrodisia is likely to depend on the environment. Taking a common dose for sleep is going to be different than taking the same dose with a sexual partner, for example. It's therefore hypothesized that the pro-sexual effects aren't inherently drastic, but they can present in certain environments partly due to expectancy. When it was still being prescribed, the drug was given for insomnia, anxiety, and sometimes for other forms of sedation. Some papers found it didn't lead to a hangover feeling in insomnia, unlike barbiturates. When that quality was combined with its alleged lack of recreational and addiction potential, a lot of physicians and patients quickly adopted the drug. Beginning in the 1950s, research found it had hypnotic effects similar to barbiturates. It was reliably shown to be a fine drug for sleep. Some impact on sleep architecture was seen, such as a decline in stage 4 sleep. REM also sometimes dropped, albeit to a limited degree, and these architecture changes seemed to dissipate with chronic use. Other less common uses included providing sedation before operations. The drug lasts for six to eight hours when used medically, and the core recreational effects are present for about four to six hours, with the full effects persisting a little longer. The onset is around 30 minutes. 
Methaquilone is a quinazolinone derivative, placing it outside the typical depressant categories. Though early studies suggested the drug operated at the benzodiazepine receptor site, this doesn't appear accurate. To understand how it may be operating, we have to consider the fact that multiple modulatory sites exist at GABA-A. The benzodiazepine site is a popular one, but there are others for barbiturates, neurosteroids, and other kinds of substances. Further, GABA-A is made up of multiple subunits. Different subunit composition result in a multitude of receptor complexes that respond differently to drugs. Methaquilone primarily functions as a positive allosteric modulator, meaning it alters activity by enhancing the effects of GABA. It has some minor agonist properties, but those are less significant. When co-applied with GABA, it can significantly increase the generated chloride currents, which are responsible for inhibiting neurotransmission. Once it was determined to be a positive allosteric modulator, the primary question became, where does it bind? Experiments looking at the benzodiazepine, barbiturate, and neurosteroid sites showed methaquilone wasn't utilizing those regions, but some positive results came at the transmembrane beta-alpha subunit interface. This interface has multiple binding sites and has not been heavily studied, though we do know etomidate, which is used for anesthesia, operates in this region. A specific region on the beta subunit has been identified as vital for methaquilone's properties, and methaquilone shares a lot of pharmacological qualities with etomidate, so it seems we can say they are somewhat similar GABA-A modulators. The Tmax is around 2 to 3 hours. While the half-life is often said to be over 10 to 20 hours, some research indicates it's closer to 4 hours. The medical dose is 150 to 400 milligrams for sleep, but it can also be used during the day for sedation and anxiolysis. One of the daytime dosing schedules is 75 milligrams three to four times. Recreationally, a light dose is 150 to 300 milligrams, the common dose is 300 to 600 milligrams, and a strong dose is over 600 milligrams. Methaquilone was synthesized in India in 1951. It was created as part of a program looking for anti-malarial drugs. Though it wasn't useful for that purpose, it was found to be a hypnotic by 1955. In rats, it was more potent than phenobarbital and had a longer duration. Clinical investigations were underway by the early 1960s in the US, France, and the UK. Those trials showed it was useful for sleep, and some other research showed it could have additional applications, such as anesthesia, and muscle relaxation in tetanus. Before the drug's recreational history in the U.S. began, it was popular in other countries. Based on its history in the U.K., Germany, and Japan, U.S. regulators should have known about its non-medical potential. Researchers, prescribers, and users in those countries initially believed the drug was safer and less recreational than barbiturates. It turned out they were largely wrong. It would eventually achieve notoriety everywhere from France and Sweden to Argentina and Iceland because of its non-medical use. The drug launched as Revenol in West Germany in 1960, and as Dormatil in East Germany two years later. In both cases, it was available over-the-counter, unlike barbiturates. Extensive advertising and the perceived safety of the drug led to widespread use. It was a major source of overdoses at medical centers around Hamburg and other locations by the mid-1960s, and it even became popular among U.S. military personnel in Germany in the early 1970s. They were sometimes getting it from drugstores using fake prescriptions. Isai Company launched Himanil in Japan in 1960, also with no prescription requirement. By 1964, the World Health Organization had a report on the epidemic-like outbreak of abuse of hypnotic drugs in a particular region. Methaquilone is now reported to constitute four-fifths of the total amount of hypnotic drugs abused in the group studied. Although Japan wasn't named, it's thought to have been the country being discussed. From 1961 to 1962, 2,000 young people were arrested and identified as abusers of methaquilone. Most were arrested in groups, and they'd often take hymenil together at coffee shops. Many were just 15 years old and were hypothetically taking the drug to reduce anxiety and stress associated with entering competitive high schools. Boots Pure Drug Company brought Melcedin to the UK in 1959. Promotion wasn't significant, so there were very few reports of Melcedin abuse until the mid-1960s. With demand for a 
safe, non-barbiturate sleep aid growing, especially in the wake of thalidomide's failure, Russo Laboratories came out with Mandrax. It was perfect timing for a drug like methaquilone to appear. Mandrax combined the substance with a typical dose of diphenhydramine. Unlike Melcidin, Mandrax was promoted through a vigorous marketing campaign. Prescriptions from family doctors in England and Wales went from 45,000 in 1965 to 2 million in 1971, while barbiturates saw millions of fewer prescriptions. All through that time, more Mandrax-related overdoses were being reported. The drug gained a reputation among recreational users as being a nice, euphoric substance. Because it could also cause coordination impairment, Mandrax tablets were sometimes called wall bangers. It got another boost in popularity when injectable methamphetamine and heroin became more restricted. Regulators and physicians in the U.S. were either unaware of this history or they didn't care. At least until the early 1970s, the global media and scientific literature had already discussed methaquilone's non-medical and dependence potential, but that didn't change much. Methaquilone by itself was approved in 1965 by the FDA under the name Quaalude from William H. Rohr. It was followed by Soper from Arner Stone and Perest from Park Davis. When it entered the market, doctors only had to prescribe it in an ethical way. Other restrictions were basically absent, unlike with barbiturates, since it also had a better reputation, widespread use was bound to occur. And that's exactly what happened. It would take until the 1970s for restrictions to really appear. This was despite pieces in the British Medical Journal and other journals already questioning whether the alleged value of methaquilone outweighs its addictive potential. Many cases of non-medical use and even physical dependence began to appear. Rohrer defended the drug against those early claims. In 1966, it chastised a paper that had indicted without justification a relatively safe and effective sedative hypnotic. By 1970, sales were reportedly 3.4 million per year in the U.S., and 91 million units were prescribed in 1971, rising to 116 million in 1972. Several large thefts were reported around this time. One manufacturer reported the theft of 600,000 capsules. Authorities started to recognize the potential for issues with methaquilone. In 1970, the FDA mandated stricter language on ads and patient labeling. However, the manufacturer now just claimed psychological dependence occasionally occurs and physical dependence has rarely been reported. A dramatic rise in non-medical use was seen around 1972. Many articles discussed how popular the drug had become. A doctor from the National Institute of Health was quoted in the Washington Post as saying, there's no doubt that methaquilone has suddenly become a rage. The Washington Post argued it became popular because federal agencies endorsed its image as a good drug. Time said methaquilone was so fashionable among some drug cultures that bowls of it have replaced peanuts as a cocktail-style staple. It was labeled the hottest drug on the streets by the San Francisco Chronicle. Similar reports appeared in the medical literature. An editorial in Clinical Toxicology, for example, said it had become the most desired drug for non-medical use on the street and college markets. Come 1972, the only requirement for obtaining methaquilone was a prescription, but the authorities began to strongly oppose that system. Some groups started to request the drug be placed in Schedule 2. Senator Birch Bay echoed that demand. Bay held hearings on the matter, in which the FDA chief defended its activities up to that point by saying there was nothing in the FDA files or the medical literature to alert us to problems. Yet the chief also admitted there was widespread non-medical consumption. Many other people testified at those hearings in a way that could support Schedule II status. Rohrer tried to prevent this, arguing it should be in Schedule III, a less restrictive category. That argument failed, and the drug became Schedule II in 1973. Schedule II status quickly had an impact on prescriptions and the drug's popularity was affected. However, supply and demand did not disappear. Drug diversion remained popular and stress clinics were using script doctors to continue supplying the market. While there may have been a dip in usage during the mid-1970s, the drug experienced a resurgence around 1978. That same year, Rohrer sold its rights to Quaalude to Lemon Pharmaceuticals. In a letter to stockholders, the company's chairman explained their decision to sell the brand name. Quaalude accounted for less than 2% of our sales, but created 98% of our headaches. Continued publicity about the abuse of this product was hurting the reputation of the company. In the early 1980s, the DEA said methaquilone was the leading drug of abuse next to cannabis. Many people were being exposed due to diversion and illegitimate prescribing, and there was also a thriving black market. Black market methaquilone contained anywhere from 25 to 500 milligrams of the drug, making it more dangerous, and sometimes the products contained entire 
entirely different drugs, while only four tons of legal methacolone was distributed in 1980, up to 100 tons was made internationally and smuggled into the US. An apparent route involved bulk powder coming from Europe and being shipped to Colombia, where it was placed into tablets. From there, groups in Colombia would export it to the US, which received an estimated 80% of the world's methacolone. The DEA worked with authorities in other countries to deal with the smuggling issue. Some countries implemented new controls and even eliminated production because of the negotiations. Much of the methacolone entering the country came in through Florida and Texas, which also saw quite significant use of the drug. At this time, Lemon was furious about the way its drug had been portrayed. It continued to say it's a fine drug when used as indicated. All of the negative media coverage was leading to a decline in sales, something Lemon wanted to avoid. It tried to convince doctors the product was actually safe and should still be prescribed. In medical journals, Lemon took out ads encouraging physicians not to permit the abuses of illegal users to deprive a legitimate patient of the drug. It tried to counter the stigma against Quaalude by selling the drug under the name Mequin, which hit the market in 1978. Yet the medical community was taking a progressively harsher stance towards the drug. The American Medical Association stated methacolone appears to have no advantage over other hypnotics, and some states had started to implement stricter controls against it. Lemon, the only remaining U.S. manufacturer, stopped producing the drug in 1983. It was placed in Schedule 1 in 1984, preventing any more medical use. The illicit market continued for a time, but by the 1990s, methacolone was no longer a top drug, and many of the tablets, typically designed like Quaaludes, actually contained drugs like diazepam. U.S. and international authorities cracked down on the remaining illicit supply with initiatives like Operation Hammerhead. Following a two-year investigation, 57 members of a large smuggling ring were indicted. They brought an alleged 54 tons of methacolone to the U.S. between 1979 and 1983. Seizures were made in Miami, Canada, the Bahamas, Panama, and Spain. U.S. Attorney Leon Kellner said, what the results of these indictments have done to the market is that you simply will not see illicit counterfeit Quaalude tablets on the street any longer. We have pretty well dried up this market, not only in the United States, but worldwide. One of the large and surprising producers of methacolone around the late 1980s and early 1990s was a group associated with the South African government. During apartheid, the government approved Project Coast, a secret chemical and biological weapons program. For a time, that project involved non-lethal riot control chemicals, including methacolone. It was led by Dr. Wouter Bassan, who established multiple private front companies to increase the program's secrecy. At some point, he was allegedly involved in trying to distribute methacolone on the illicit market. According to a UN report, one ton was produced, including 3.5 million Mandrax capsules. When the program was shuttered, a stockpile of tablets and powder was left behind. Some of that could have entered the illicit market, helping the South African methacolone trade. Because of this, some have blamed Bassan and the apartheid regime for the widespread use of methacolone in the country. Outside of that program, the methacolone market was fueled by an international drug trade. The drug was produced in India and other parts of Africa, with it primarily ending up in South Africa. A significant rise in Mandrax trafficking and use appeared to occur in the 1990s. Factories in Kenya and other places helped to supply the market, though in the 2000s, a lot of the production became concentrated in South Africa and India. Other sources were reportedly the Middle East and possibly China. This trade between India and Africa remains significant. For example, in just one case in 2016, 23.5 tons of Mandrax tablets were seized in India. They were reportedly intended for export to South Africa and Mozambique. Like with MDMA, tablets can have a variety of designs and colors that people falsely associate with specific strengths. While the drug was historically used orally, an inhalation practice called a white pipe is popular in Africa. It involves inhaling crushed tablets, frequently alongside cannabis or tobacco. Methacolone is very popular in South Africa, often coming in second only to cannabis. There's very little use of methacolone in the U.S. nowadays. A few seizures still take place, but most of what's on the market is fake. Ever since the 1970s, fake Quaalude tablets have been popular, and the most popular kind was Lemon 714 tablets. The DEA at one point said it was the most common illicitly replicated pharmaceutical product. Clandestine manufacturers settled on diazepam for their Lemon 714 tablets when the real drug went away. Sometimes those tablets contain excessive benzodiazepine doses, leading to overdose and even fatalities. A couple factors contributed to the more recent interest in methacolone, specifically quaaludes. First, the Wolf of Wall Street in 2013 prominently
prominently featured the drug. And second, it was revealed comedian Bill Cosby had used methaquilone to facilitate sexual assault. The drug is Schedule 1 in the US. It's also controlled in Australia, Canada, Germany, and the UK, among many other countries. The safety profile of methaquilone is a bit atypical. At moderate overdoses, it comes with concerns like unconsciousness, vomit aspiration, falls, and coma. Death could occur, especially when combined with other drugs like ethanol. However, it normally doesn't have the same strong respiratory depressant effects as some other depressants. When you have a very large overdose, such as over 2 grams, some of the primary concerns become increased muscle tone, seizures, and coma. Hemorrhages, including of the retina, have been reported with large overdoses. Doses. Recreational doses can cause non-problematic tingling and paresthesia, but for some people the drug also leads to peripheral neuropathy, characterized by more persistent numbness, weakness, sensory impairment, and other issues. This seems to be a rare idiosyncratic response that can appear even at medical doses. Another rare but serious concern are allergic reactions like fixed drug eruption and erythema multiform. These are also idiosyncratic responses that have shown up in a very small number of users. Tolerance and withdrawal do exist with the substance. With heavy chronic use, the withdrawal could potentially be dangerous and at least highly unpleasant. It can include anxiety, headache, muscle twitching, tremor, nausea, sweating, vomiting, and possibly delirium and seizures. Some of the risky combinations include other depressants like ethanol, opioids, and benzodiazepines. It's also best to avoid dissociatives. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. You can also email me with questions. The Drug Classroom is exclusively funded by donations. Listeners like you make TDC possible. If you want to support, please do so on Patreon.